but it was not billing itself as this is a new theory called intelligent design theory. All the ideas are there though. This is a book on the origin of life and why the origin of life is impossible to explain through natural cause. In the foreword to this book, Dean Kenyon wrote, it's fundamentally implausible that unassisted matter and energy organize themselves into living systems. Fundamentally implausible. The assumption here is that certain things in nature that are of such complexity and difficulty to explain just should be taken off the table and you don't even try to explain them through natural cause. Scientists have been trying to explain the origin of life for decades and they haven't succeeded. It's time to admit that this is an unsolvable problem and just attribute it to the intelligent agent who is, of course, God. Uh, but you can't say God because then you can't get taught in the public school, so we'll just say it's an intelligent agent. Okay. And I don't think anybody really is fooled. This continues to be a theme in modern intelligent design uh, because this is basically the idea of intelligent design, that there are certain things that are simply incapable of explanation, so therefore God did it. The operant idea here is structural complexity really complex things like the origin of life or the bacteria flagellum or the blood clotting cascade or some of these other examples that they use are just categorically unexplainable. We've heard this before. This was the position taken by William Paley in 1802 in his book Natural Theology where Paley wrote that if you see a watch on the heath uh, you know because of the complexity of that watch, all of these pieces, uh, all of these springs and wires and so forth that fit together, allow you to tell time, you know that those springs and wires could not have come spontaneously together to make a functional uh, watch. You know if you see a watch on the heath that there had to have been a watchmaker. If you see a rock, the rock could have been there forever, whatever. If you see a watch, you know by its structural complexity there had to be a watchmaker. So, reasoned Paley. If you see a complex biological structure like the vertebrate eye, you know because of the complexity that all of these parts, these lenses and, and um, uh, uh, liquids and, and uh, membranes and um, uh, vessels and nerves, all of these things that fit together, you know this could not have been a result of chance. So therefore there had to have been a god. Interestingly enough, his book Natural Theology was apologetics, was a, um, an argument for the existence of God. It was a way of converting people to, to Christianity. Uh, it, was, uh, it took the 1800s by storm. Uh, this was thought to be a really, really great idea and it, it brought nature together with God and made everybody very happy. Of course, this is where Charles Darwin comes in and why um, on the origin of species was such a controversial book. It wasn't because Darwin um, s supported very, very strongly the idea that living things had common ancestors, because that idea was floating around and that wasn't terribly upsetting. Darwin just kind of nailed that coffin shut because his book was so good at, at marshalling all this circumstantial evidence that the only reasonable conclusion from all of these kinds of data is that living things shared common ancestors rather than having been created separately. It was his mechanism of natural selection, which as I mentioned before, was a natural mechanism that resulted in design. And in fact, knowing that his contemporaries were very familiar with Paley's watch and the eye as examples of, of special creation, of design, Darwin specifically used the eye as an example in On the Origin of Species, as an example of how natural selection can produce complex structures. A natural process can produce complexity. It's not a matter of these pieces falling together randomly by chance. And that was a huge, huge revelation. Well, I want to talk about the second of Buell's book. The first book, um, Mystery of Life's Origin, uh, did present um, the basic idea of intelligent design. But his second book um, started floating around in the, uh, or references to it, started floating around in 1981. Uh, you notice the um, headline there about uh, lawsuit prospects dim in Arkansas, bright in Louisiana. This is from the Students for Origins Research, sorry, Students for Origins Research newsletter, a, a young earth creationist group, 1981. But I want to call your attention to this news article right here. 
unbiased biology textbook plan. A high school biology textbook is in the planning stages that will be sensitively written to present both evolution and creation while limiting discussion to scientific data. Hmm, that's very interesting. This book became of pandas and people. Now, this was the first book to use the phrase intelligent design in the modern sense, in reference to this movement that we recognize as being based in this earlier uh, movement. And, um, and, and that's kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, most scientific theories um, follow kind of a standard trajectory. Uh, you get the idea, you go out and test it, you build your theory, you get other people doing research, you write papers, you uh, test ideas some more, you throw out the things that don't work, you gradually build an explanation, you gradually build your theoretical perspective, and you convince your colleagues that this is a better mousetrap, so to speak, you convince your colleagues that your theory is really good, and then everybody starts testing it and using it, and pretty soon everybody says, we knew it all along, um, this is a really good explanation. <laughs> And then you write a textbook. The intelligent design people did it all backwards. They wrote the textbook first before they did any of the research. Now that is a curious approach. And I think does help to illustrate the, my point that I would like to make, that intelligent design really is a social and political movement rather than a true scientific movement. The first thing these guys did, virtually, was write a textbook so they could get their ideas into the high school curriculum. They didn't go out and try to convince scientists that intelligent design was a legitimate scientific field and go out and test its ramifications. No, no, they wrote the textbook first. It's an interesting approach. Well, the science in, of pandas and people is just awful. Uh, it repeats most of the same creation science arguments. There are gaps in the fossil record. Uh, natural selection can't produce complicated things. Uh, homology is a bogus concept, and so forth. I want to just give you a quick little example of why the science of, of uh, pandas and people is so terrible. And I want to use their example of molecular homology. They have this picture in Pandas and People, and don't worry about reading the fine print, because I will tell you what the text says. You see a bullfrog, a turtle, a chicken, a rabbit, and a horse there on the right-hand side, and then all those little lines go back to carp, fish. Um, this is a, um, a map of genetic distances of cytochrome C, which is a very stable molecule. And you see that uh, bullfrog, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and horse all have about the same molecular distance from carp, 13, 13, 14, 13, 13, they're all about the same distance. Now here's what the text says. Amphibians, represented in the chart by the bullfrog, are traditionally considered closer to fish in the evolutionary scale. Yet on a molecular level, they are no closer to fish than to reptiles or to mammals. To use the classic Darwinian scenario, amphibians are intermediate between fish and other land-dwelling vertebrates. Analysis of their amino acids should place amphibians in an approximately intermediate position, but it does not. Is there an evolutionary biologist in the house? No. Are you clenching your teeth? <laughs> Don't do that. It's bad for your gums. Okay. 